I'm with Dave Bella in Manchester, UK today. Morning, Dave. Thank you. Morning. We are at the SGM's Spring Conference here. Yes. Where you received the Peter Wilde Prize for Microbiology Education yesterday. I did. Yeah, Congratulations. A, thank you very much. It was an interesting experience to talk about something a little bit different. And let's talk a little bit about you today. I okay. Want to learn how did you become a virologist? Uh, it was kind of by accident, really. It was more because I was interested in electron microscopy. Uh, and the first job opportunity that came up was as a, working as a diagnostic virologist. And mm -hmm. it, it seemed like an interesting area. And, and then I started doing electron microscopy of viruses and I was hooked. <laughs> so it was really because you were interested in looking at very small things. Yes, yeah. Well, playing with big toys, big gadgets. Yeah, I think I'm, yeah. I'm a gadget boy at heart. So did you get a PhD in structural biology? Yes, yeah. So I did a PhD in uh, cryo-electron microscopy of uh, retrotransposon capsids. So. Yeah. So a retrotransposon capsid is something made from an endogenous gene that we have? That's right, yeah. yeah. So it never leaves the cell, yeah. but it's just a, I guess it's a sort of vestigial retro. retro is, this was a human? Uh, uh, no, it was a yeast capsid. Oh, uh, uh, a company was interested in the possibility of using this capsid as a, as a vaccine delivery system. Right. Because you could insert large chunks of uh, foreign protein into it. But. So now you are at the Center for Virus Research in Glasgow. Uh -huh. right? You yes. have your own laboratory where you, you continue to do structural yes. studies on yeah. viruses. So yeah. what are some of the viruses whose structures you have solved? So we've worked on many, many viruses over the years. And I guess this result stems from my interest in my, start, the, my career start in diagnostic mm -hmm. uh, virology. I, was, uh, I just find all viruses fascinating. So over, over the years we've worked on uh, picornaviruses, herpes viruses. Uh, at the moment I work on caliche viruses and uh, both ortho and paramyxo viruses. I guess over, over the sort of duration of the time I've been in the, the CVR, most of my work has been on paramyxo viruses. Mm -hmm. uh, so focusing on RSV and measles. Do you have a favorite structure of yours? Favorite structure? Uh, probably, it's usually the last structure I solved, I think, actually. <laughs> it's, 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 it's sort of these incremental improvements in performance yeah. and, and outcome. So yeah. Uh, I visited your lab last year and you uh -huh. had models of different viruses printed on 3D printers. Yes, yeah. And I yeah. went and looked online and some of those big ones, you can, you can pay several thousand dollars. Yeah, it gets very things. expensive very quickly, especially depending on what material you want to print in. But they, they were really striking. So we yeah. made one for, uh, when my last director retired, we made a, a bronze herpes capsid sculpture a for bronze? Him. Bronze, yeah, wow. printed in bronze. And it was beautiful. That's yeah. quite nice. Yeah. Must be heavy as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wasn't there for him to throw it at me. but. Yeah. So when I, when I started <laughs> working in virology in the late 70s, there was some structural biology, but there was very little way to, to visualize viruses. But now yeah. that's changed. Yes. Yeah. I remember back then, we, didn't, we couldn't even look at the structures on a computer. Uh, yes. So yeah. wh why is that? Why can we do that? Oh, I guess it's just computing power, the improvements in computing power, the improvements in graphics processors that right. allow us now to, to, to look at some really large structures uh, in, in real time and move them around. Right. Even when I moved to Glasgow, I mean, I moved to Glasgow just over uh, 14 years ago. Uh, and at that point, we had to buy a silicon graphics computer that was like 65,000 pounds in order right. to look exactly. at a reconstruction of a herpes capsid. And, and now you can do it on a, yeah. on a video card that costs you 70 pounds. Sure. And so, so, consumer yeah. computers, you yeah, can view yeah. these, you can do rotations. Yes. I mean, yeah. It's amazing how it's changed. So we can have beautiful static pictures of viruses now, but yes. will we ever be able to watch viruses move and do things in cells at that kind of resolution? Um, I, I don't know is the honest answer. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that happening with electron microscopy anytime mm -hmm. soon. I think, I think the issue is always one of uh, uh, the, the amount of signal you can get from a, a single molecule when you image it in using uh, technology like right. electrons or x-rays. But hey, it would be wonderful if you could. I mean, breakthroughs in, in, in light microscopy seem to be sort of uh, breaking this resolution barrier down. So may, may, maybe, maybe with light uh, at some yeah. point in the future, we'll be able to see these things. So, yeah. Now you were here because you received the Wilde Prize, which is for educating the public about microbes. And one of the things you talked about yesterday was how you go to a science center and do that with yes. young people. Can you tell uh, us a little bit about that? Sure, yes. So uh, f we built a very strong relationship with Glasgow Science Centre, mm -hmm. uh, which provides a great environment for delivering outreach activities uh, and working with school students. Uh, and we do this through a number of different activities. But really, our flagship, flagship activity is the uh, Applications of DNA Technology Workshop, which is uh, an, a whole day workshop looking at the polymerase chain reaction with high school mm -hmm. students. Those are students who are about 16, 17 years old, uh, study, studying for advanced higher biology, which I guess in, in, in England is the A-level. I don't know what the equivalent in the U.S. is for of that sort of a, that, that qualification, but um, so they're, they're they're very advanced students and they're okay. learning about okay. molecular biology and it's it's a really uh, 
fun day for us and a really sort of fun day for them. And so they actually do a polymerase chain reaction, Yes, right? yeah. yeah. So, so but, but it sounds like they're advanced enough that they can do that. Could you do this with a younger crowd? I, I don't see why not. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, effectively, it's about diligent pipetting right. you know, when you do right. a, any, any sort of uh, <laughs> experiment like that. And, and we have the teaching resources that make it, the concepts underlying PCR yeah, yeah. quite easy to understand. So uh, I don't see there's any reason why you couldn't do it with sort of students who are in the sort of 10 to 14 age, right. age right. range. I mean, we do, we you get them using micro pipettes in our Meet the Expert activities, which mm -hmm. we do on the floors in the public areas of the Science Centre. So we, How do they respond to this experience? Do they love it? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, well, I mean, they love it on many levels. I mean, for, for someone who's never really sort of worked with scientific equipment, just actually using micro pipettes yeah. is, is, is really, really fun and exciting for them because they see it on TV and things like CSI mm -hmm. and, you know, and then actually to be able to do it is, yeah. is, is really good fun. Um, and doing things like vortexing things and, and putting in the micro centrifuge, it's, it's, it's right. usually engaging. They so love doing it. These yeah. are things they've never done before? Really? Generally not, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, schools in, in, in Britain are sort of fairly under-resourced in terms of laboratory equipment, mm -hmm. so it's, it's quite hard for them to provide their students with exposure mm -hmm. to even quite simple laboratory equipment these days. So, yeah, they, they do, and, and, and they really, really, really <laughs> go for it. Yeah. So you talked yesterday about an experiment where there was a novel virus, a neurovirus-related outbreak. Yes. Yeah. Did, you, did you actually provide the students with stool samples to work on? Well, they were yeah, fake stool samples. It wasn't yeah, real so stool, it wasn't, Yeah, no, I think that would be, that would be quite <laughs> disgusting. And uh, yeah, we'd have to do it in a microbiology safety yes. cabinet. So, I was uh, wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're, they're fake stool samples that are basically made from, from Weetabix uh, cereal and, okay. uh, and, and, and water. Well, you, did you spike very, them with uh, a, a DNA? Or? No, no. So what we did there was a, a um, latex agglutination test, so okay. a, a, a fake latex agglutination test. So actually, okay. it's, it's just uh, low pH. So we take some uh, neutral pH and some uh, acidified stool samples, and then when you mix them with milk, that uh, milk curdles and it looks, right. it happens very right, quickly, right. but it looks just like a, a, a real latex agglutination test. So it's, okay. it's, it's, it's a totally mocked up experiment. But uh, yeah, it, the main thing is actually just taking the stool samples, putting it in a buffer, vortexing it, then putting it in the micro centrifuge. And that's right, the, the right. sort of real, real fun bit. You know? And that was in a context of trying to figure out which samples had a virus in them, yes, right? Yes, yes. So they yeah. probably like that very much. Yes, I think yes. that's the thing, sort of the backstory of having this sort of very frightening new virus is, right, is right. kind of a, a So why did you get involved in doing this? You have a lab, you have a lot of work to do. Why do you do this, this science Well, center? I mean, f yeah, f uh, firstly, um, I've always been interested in telling people about, about viruses. Mm -hmm. So when I, have, I was working as a diagnostic scientist, I've had all these micrographs and I'd take them home and I'd show them to my friends and I think they got a little bit fed up with it in the end, but they, they found it immensely amusing yeah. that I, when I had this collection of micrographs that I'd show anyone who had the time to, to, to look at. When I did my first 3D reconstruction in Glasgow, it was actually of a herpes capsid, uh, but I made an anaglyph, you know, a 3D, red-blue 3D picture of this herpes capsid and gave it to a friend of mine. And he, he loved it. He actually had it framed and put it up in his bathroom uh, with, with, with these uh, red-blue glasses so that people would look at it while they were on, on the uh, throne. And um, he, he, you know, so it sort of made me realize that people really like these images, you know, and uh, I, I thought that would be a really good thing to do. And actually, the Molecular Machines Art Exhibition was mm -hmm. probably the first thing I decided to do. Uh, but actually the first thing we did was the PCR workshop, uh, which was really precipitated by my wife and her, her mm -hmm. interest in uh, providing a really quality uh, school's experience teaching molecular biology to school students. So yeah. uh, she had a very strong influence in me, in my decision to move into this area. And I think these things do take a lot of time. It's quite mm -hmm. a, a big investment of, of work, but although it's sort of, when I stood up and gave my presentation last night, I, I talked about a lot of different activities. I think it's important to emphasize that those were developed over quite a long period of time. Yeah. So Molecular Machines was done in 2007, the PCR workshop was done in 2005. And once you've developed an activity, of course you can deliver it again and again mm -hmm. and again, and it actually only takes you then a couple of days to do that. So um, I think it's not such a huge investment that a, a scientist with a busy lab can't make mm -hmm. that make that effort to, to do these yeah. things. And I think it's a really important aspect of our work. Uh, and it's really important for the CVR to be seen to be doing this and, and uh, MRC requires its of us to, yeah. to, uh, to do this so outreach work. So it sounds like you think many scientists should do similar things. I think that those who have an inclination shouldn't, yeah. shouldn't shy away from it on the grounds that they think they're too busy. Uh, you can start quite small mm -hmm. and, and, and grow it over, over the years. And, and it's, it's not for everyone, uh, certainly, yeah. but I think for, for those people who have a uh, uh, an interest in communication and, and, sure. and, and, the, sure. and the skills, they should, they should do it, yes. I mean, structural biology and structural virology lends itself, because it's very visual, 
You can make beautiful pictures. Even someone who works on an individual molecule, it can be beautiful too. But what yes. about others who don't have any visuals in their science? What sure. Do do? Uh, I, I mean, it's certainly, I think a lot of people uh, enjoy my research seminars because right. the structural biology is very eye-catching and, uh, yeah. uh, and it's, uh, it's very engaging to, to work with. But actually, I think our most successful activity is, is the PCR workshop, and that's pure molecular biology. Uh, it's, it's quite ironic that I spend quite a lot of my outreach time teaching PCR yeah. because I've never actually done PCR in anger myself. <laughs> right. It goes on in my lab, but uh, I've, I've always been an electron microscopist. But uh, I think, I think uh, yeah, molecular biology is actually what students and uh, young people really want to learn about. So you don't need to be a structural biologist to have this yeah. sort of level of engagement. Yeah. You had some very nice examples yesterday of teaching students about DNA sequencing and how you can you could animate that with very simple tools on a blackboard. Yes, yeah. And we're, that'll be in your prize lecture, which people can see yes, uh, afterwards. Yeah. Do you have a website that people can go to to see your work? To see some of the resources from the uh, Applications of DNA Technology Workshop, they can look on the Education Scotland website. Okay. But they need to search uh, for specific terms. So it's for the higher biology, and I think it's higher human biology, uh, DNA sequencing. Mm -hmm. There's Those resources are there. So there's a quick time movie showing all our animations, and there's also a movie of Susan delivering the... Yeah. Um, the uh, DNA sequencing activity. Uh, so and then there's a Molecular Machines website yes, as well. Yes, so that's uh, molecularmachines.org.uk. Okay. And you have a YouTube channel as well? Yes, yeah, with about four videos on it. So uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't take that long to navigate. But uh, okay. yes, so that's got our adenovirus animation and the Molecular right. Machines animation. So I have one more question for you, David, and then we'll let you go and see the meeting. And that is, do you know what virus that is? It's Polio virus, isn't it? Yes. yes. Uh, decorated with PVR. Decorated with polyvirus receptor. Yeah. Very good. You're yes. a bona fide structural virologist. <laughs> thank you for talking thank with you. us today. And thank congratulations you on thank the Wildey Award. And thank you for all your help. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you.